imagine. Oh, great. Got it. Okay. okay. Got so, it. Uh, it. Of course, I'm relieved that there are only five of us or six because I really am terrified of speaking in front of crowds. So I thought there'll be 60 people here and I'll faint before I even say a word. You and Gloria Steinem does not like, oh, Gloria really? Steinem does oh, not like to talk in front of crowds. Great company. Thank you for saying that. So, uh, so I'm really relieved and the, I'm already feeling a little bit more secure. Great. <laughs> so I just, um, and I want to thank you from really from the bottom of my heart and it's very deep uh, for doing this. I mean, for first of all, for agreeing to invite his paintings into your space and then to help to, um, to, to help to organize it and to invite uh, Joanne Palmer to write a, um, a beautiful article about this and the pictures were astounding and uh, I know that um, I, I got some uh, phone calls from people I didn't even know read this publication that, uh, oh, Anna, is it you? <laughs> is in that article? So I became a little famous. But uh, no, but um, it, 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 it proves to me that, uh, that uh, the word is getting out there and that, uh, that uh, what I have, had promised him perhaps is slowly um, get, getting real, which I can't believe even. I'm, I'm afraid to even think that, but, but I think it's possible that that is actually it is happening. So thank you so much for all of your efforts and, and uh, just, I, I have no words. To express that and I'm speaking also I, I said it in the email on behalf of my group of emigres who uh, have been with you Rick, through all this time and I don't know if you read the article where I uh, described how this it came to, how this group came to be and uh, but um, I'll tell you briefly so in 1968 uh, Polish uh, communist government launched an anti-Semitic campaign uh, again, and um, uh, basically exiled uh, the Jews from the country. When we left, uh, we were um, stripped of our citizenship. So we left as stateless people and with $5 to our name for the rest of our journey. We were not allowed to take more than $5. So, uh, of course, we weren't allowed to take anything uh, that was of any value, and we were um, um, uh, uh, there were soldiers who were at the train station who were checking our luggage to see if we, God forbid, are not taking out a book or, you know, uh, an album or a, or a porcelain cup. And, and this was very dramatic because uh, people, of course, tried, and uh, um, and there were scenes at the train station that um, in 1968 that you would think um, were happening in uh, 1939 or 40, but nobody uh, was killed. We were just exiled from the country. And so in this, uh, so this. Uh, event is common to um, to the people who I call our group, which is the emigres of that year. Because there's always some emigration to America uh, by the Jews, but this was unusual because it wasn't, um, uh, it wasn't um, to join families, you know, it wasn't um, to find the work because uh, for economical reasons, it was because the government told us that we couldn't stay there. And uh, so that year, about 15,000 uh, Jewish people left Poland. And this was half of half of the, all the people that were there at that time. So um, a lot of them were people who, um, a, lot of, a lot of them were students, kids, 
um, because they were we were all the um, the survivors' children, so we were born after the war. So we're all, or a lot of us, were the same age. And those of us who came to New York area, we created this social group, and uh, there, um, Yurek comes into play. Yurek has shown up in the group in um, about the time when we came to to um, New York area, and from that point on. Uh, I'm saying we, but I didn't really become part of that group until later, until um, about 40 years ago. Uh, we were, uh, and this happened over 50 years ago. And I'm saying that because there were people who took care of Jurek, which is Jerzy Bitter, and that's his um, uh, nickname. Uh, before I even before I met him, uh, and I it's so. Shall I tell you what happened? What happened from his birth on? But or do you all know what happened? Because I already um, described it, described it for Joanne. Or how would you like? Why don't you tell the story in your own words? Yeah. And talk about this his story yeah. and your story and how okay, right. these two stories came okay. together uh -huh. in New York. So when I met Jurek, um, this was about uh, 40 years ago, uh, I already knew who he was. I met him for the first time uh, accidentally at the bus stop. And I knew who he was from the descriptions uh, of him that I um, heard from my friends and of course he was speaking Polish so it, it, everything got I, I put everything together and I said that must be that Jurek Bitter who is um, uh, who everybody is talking about who is uh, uh, who has just uh, recently come to to the US and had this terrible accident and you could see uh, that he was um, not uh, not uh, that he was somewhat handicapped. He because so what happened to him? Well, okay, this is going to be very chaotic because I don't know which order. But let's let's start from the beginning. So Jurek was born in 1941 in Lvov, in Ukraine. Uh, he was born in the ghetto, and. Uh, that ghetto was under Russian occupation at first, and then it became, in 1941, it uh, found itself under German occupation because of the, uh, because uh, um, Germans attacked, um, Germany attacked Russia in spite of the Molotov-Ribbentrop agreement about non-aggression, right? So, when the Germans uh, took over the ghetto, everybody knew that this was going to be liquidated, which means that everybody will be sent to the ovens. So Jurek's mother took the baby, I think he was nine months old, and got on the train full of German soldiers to go to, she decided to go to Warsaw because in Warsaw, she decided to go to Warsaw ghetto because there she was hoping to, um, or maybe she knew her husband was there at that time. I, I don't exactly know how they were separated and then reunited um, in the ghetto, why he was in the Warsaw ghetto and she was in the Lvov ghetto, uh, but that's what happened. She got on the train and um, she was um, in the, you know, those European trains, they have compartments um, where for six people or eight people facing each other, everybody in her compartment was, uh, they, they were all German soldiers. And the, she knew German and she was blonde and blue eyed. And she had Europe who was not blonde and blue eyed and, and uh, spoke to them 
German and they actually thought she was German. And they and that and she survived that's how she survived the train ride to Warsaw. Then after she uh, joined Warsaw Ghetto, she realized she is not going to survive there with the baby. Um, stories about I heard stories about um, there was one person in the ghetto who had a cow and Jurek's aunt paid her or made, I don't know how she, she arranged that, but she arranged that Jurek had a glass of milk every day. And he uh, ascribes this fact to, to his survival, to his first, um, first stage of his survival. So there was a cow in the ghetto, Jurek got the cow's milk, and that's how he could live because people didn't, there was, you know, there, were, there was no nourishment there. there was, um, everybody knows, right? I don't have to talk about that. Um, it, I, I know it not only from the book that his mother wrote about um, what happened to them during the war. And I'll tell you about the book later. I think I sent you the uh, information about it in the very beginning. The, um, uh, no? Okay, then I will, I'll get it to you. If you, if you're interested. Uh, and, uh, uh, but uh, uh, she real realized she didn't have a chance to survive. And th that ghetto was also being liquidated and she somehow got out um, on a, I remember on a, the, the way I, I remember him telling me that was that it was a horse wagon was a wagon and there were a lot of people and they were hiding under a bed of straw. So they were not visible. There were certain people who were allowed to leave, but they were hidden and they left. And the, uh, from that point on, she had to find a place for them to hide on the Aryan side. It was called Aryan side, right? The, the ghetto was Jewish. So she uh, had some ad addresses of people who she thought might help her, and uh, and they did. She found these two school teachers who um, uh, whose address she had after you know it, I'm, it, it's a giant um, contraction of facts. It's I'm not telling you a lot that I know, but it, it's it's uh, not relevant. Or oh, and another thing that I want to, I mean, it's very relevant, but not to this, to the art of Jurek. But I want to tell you that, um, well, it was, he went through hell. He went through hell as a baby and as a small child. Uh, I don't know if you read it anywhere else I have. That uh, it was, um, they were hiding in an apartment and the uh, German soldiers were coming to, or the German police uh, to check if people were hiding. So everybody would go to the basement of the building, but there was this little baby and they, if the baby cried when they were in the basement, everybody would get killed. So the, his mother had to make um, a quick decision whether she's leaving a sleeping baby in a closet and everybody goes to the basement and they pretend that nobody lives in this apartment or nobody's at the apartment at the moment. Or she, uh, or she takes the baby with her, risking that he will cry and then everybody dies. And she left him. She left him in the closet and he didn't cry. He didn't wake up. And uh, so that was, uh, he quotes that as, uh, as another instance of her saving his life, uh, you know. and and. The, what I said in the article and the, which I, what everybody says, and I have never met her, is that she was an amazing, amazing fighter. Uh, she sacrificed her life many, many, many times for him during the war and later. And the amazing thing is that she was a young girl. She was, she was in her mid-20s when all of this was happening. 
and she had to make these life and death decisions and she had to find a hiding place for her child. So after the, uh, in the meantime, her husband was in, tell me if I'm going into too much detail anyway. Too much detail? No. Uh, in the meantime, her husband was um, taken to Maidanek concentration camp. And uh, he was at the point where they were uh, digging their own graves and he decided to escape. And uh, several people decided to escape. Um, I'm not sure whether um, anybody but him survived. I think maybe they did, I can't remember right now. This is all oral history, right? You understand that I heard it from Jurek and I heard it from his friends who heard it from him. And also from the, I have here, Jurek, uh, the written material that Jurek, Jurek wrote actually as, as a memoir of that time, but it was also, it was, he was a little child, so it was based on other sources. So uh, basically his mom's, his mom's um, writings. So, um, so he escapes the father, Marek was his name. He escapes, um, he escapes being uh, thrown into the ditch and uh, finds himself in the woods where the partisans are fighting um, against Germans. They, they live, um, uh, you know, out, out, outside of the grid and in holes and that they dug. I, my, I haven't seen it, so I but read about them. It turns out that um, these groups of partisans were not always wonderful, and uh, they were actually uh, a, 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 um, they were actually trying to get rid of the Jews as well. So at one point, all the Jewish members who have escaped, mostly escaped from concentration camps, were executed by those partisans, but not Marek Bitter, not Jurek's father. He ran again and joined another group of um, underground soldiers and survived. I don't remember exactly what what kind of what, what was the name of that of that division. They let they met accidentally after the war, at the end of the, I think after just right after the war ended, his mother Jurek's mother uh, and uh, her husband. Somebody tipped him off that she may be in the town where she was. He went there. And voila, she saw him at the market and they, uh, the family reunited and they returned to, to Warsaw. And after the war uh, with the um, newly established communist government, um, life was stable in a way. Uh, Jew, the Jewish people who were returning from Russia from hiding from the from the Nazis were mostly communist. They were they were communist youth before the war because communist communism was an alternative to fascism that was uh, rising in in uh, Europe uh, before the war. And so a lot of uh, Jewish people who were very ideological and uh, young people. So we're talking about 15, 16 year olds, right? Who return um, or, or, or older teenagers who return after five years of war as people in their young, in their uh, early twenties and are, and are delighted that Poland is communist the way they had dreamt it to be. Um, and uh, didn't take very long to the, for them to, uh, to become disillusioned. Uh, that, that's another story. But Jurek, um, uh, Jurek's family, you can say prospered. There was a lot of 
there is a lot of um, damage done to these people, right? Uh, I, I mentioned to Joanne that there was no post-traumatic stress disorder treatment uh, then. Everybody had uh, uh, PTSD. So um, uh, nobody heard about, the, people were trying to feed themselves, let alone go to a therapist, right? So, uh, um, so there was a lot of uh, dysfunction in these post-war families. We all ex experienced that. We were raised by survivors who have barely kept sanity, kept their sanity during those times. Uh, Jurek always wanted to go to Israel and an opportunity came when he was um, about, uh, I don't know, 22, 23. He went for his doctoral studies to Weizmann Institute in Tel Aviv, is it? Uh, he, uh, this, was a, this was a big honor for him. As you know, Heim Weizmann was, was a big um, hero. And I, and I don't know if he had anything. It was maybe the Institute. It was Institute of Science. And to be, I, I don't know if it was named after Weizmann because he was a hero or did he had something to do with establishing it? I didn't check, fact check that. But uh, Jurek was uh, doing well as um, in his doctoral studies for chemical engineering. And so, uh, and then uh, one day when he was uh, 25, um, he had a terrible accident. He was on, a, on his motorcycle and uh, I, I, the way I imagine it, I, I mean, he told it to me, but not in detail because it was hard for him to talk about it. There was a, probably a flatbed track truck with a combine on it and the blades of the combine were uh, sticking out somehow and he got in uh, he got in their way and the blades um, almost decapitated and he said his aorta was cut a lot of blood was lost and he um, he was saved but he went into a coma for some people say three months, some people say six months. And uh, he told me anywhere between six weeks and three months. So I'm not sure I have no, we, I, I, we can assume that it was three months. His mom came from Poland, sat at his side and uh, talked to him the entire time. After he woke up from the coma, he said he heard her, but he just couldn't uh, respond. And, uh, uh, and uh, when he woke up, he, half of his body was paralyzed because he had a stroke uh, during, that, um, uh, during the accident or after, maybe while they were trying to operate on him. And he, um, his right side was completely paralyzed. And he lost his speech, he, he lost his mobility. He also lost his scientific brain. He didn't remember any of the chemical engineering that he had learned before. So, uh, and he was in despair. He didn't, have, you know, he did, uh, they, he was in a rehab, he had to relearn how to walk, how to speak. He lost his, um, some of his many languages he knew before the accident, but, but he was in despair because there was nothing that he knew he could do for the, you know. And uh, again, the story is uh, some people say that it's the lady who he, he rented his room from, discovered his talent, and some people say it was his mom. But he found himself, he, he came to, New York City and uh, where his mom had come after uh, he woke up from his coma and uh, he uh, went to NYU to for the master's in fine arts program and he did very well. 
and became a, a full-time painter, artist, who everybody knew because he was an invalid. You know, you could tell him, and he only had one arm that worked and uh, his legs, uh, one leg worked well and the other, he kind of had to uh, drag behind because uh, that's, that was the, what happened. And with this affliction, he was able to paint unbelievable amounts of work. I mean, he, uh, it, as I mentioned in the article, I have never seen, I have a lot of friends who are artists. I have never seen an artist who could uh, turn out so much work, good work, and uh, and with just having just one arm to work with, right? He can't help himself out. He can't hold his palette in one hand and brush in another. I don't really know how he did that, uh, but he did it. And uh, he had exhibits. He was, that was uh, uh, up until the eighties, I think. He was quite popular. Uh, everybody talked about Holocaust. His work, as you know, is entirely on the Holocaust theme. He doesn't paint. He has maybe five paintings among 250 that, uh, uh, this that sh that um, uh, this that show maybe his dog Pinocchio, a couple uh, of paintings of his daughter, and that's it. I that's 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 my feeling. Everything is on the theme. The, uh, he has a lot of watercolors also at home. Uh, these are these paintings that you have in the synagogue, and I have. Uh, more in the storage here are the paintings I picked up from his studio on 52nd Street and 10th Avenue, where he painted uh, every day, every single day of his life until he became too weak to do that. His health um, declined, I would say maybe after 70, after he turned 70. And uh, um, so, uh, oh, and then I, there was another um, incident in his life that was tragic, and it was the way his marriage ended. His, he married, um, I think she was a student at NYU. Um, very beautiful woman. Turned out that she was um, not well mentally, and she and they had a child, and uh, it was not possible for him to live with her. Uh, and so he, she left. Uh, he told me that she left. Uh, her his daughter told me that he left with the baby. The baby was, I think, maybe eighteen months old when he left that marriage and he raised her by herself by himself with the help of his amazing mother and i uh, every i've never met cecilia but everyone who has met her claims yurek would not live if not for her ever several times first in the ghetto then outside of the ghetto uh, then when he had the um, accident, and then when he um, when he was left alone uh, with the child, because she was she helped to raise this child. Uh, the child, her name is Eva, and she is about 40, I don't know, 42, 43 years old. I can't remember. I am in, I am in contact with her. Uh, she uh, she is actually the owner of all these paintings. I'm just a temporary custodian helping out because at the time when the studio had to be emptied of the paintings, uh, she was not able to to do it. So it kind of fell on me because um, I was the at that time I was available to do it, and also I was 
I had a relationship with Yurek that uh, we're friends. Uh, I, I took care of his needs when he, uh, after this last, there was one more accident that happened recently. It was in, in 2019 um, when he fell in his studio and he was getting very feeble by then already. He fell in his studio, he was um, painting, he was working there with his friend Manuel and uh, his, he developed a, a, a clot in his leg, a blood clot in his leg and it had to be amputated. That happened to be the good leg. So he had nothing left. He didn't have a leg, he didn't have, he couldn't uh, even stand. And he, and his arm, the good arm started to get so weak, he couldn't even lift a brush. During, and that was when, when he had that accident and found himself at Mount Sinai, that's when I, again, uh, uh, um, became, closer with him. Another time was when I lost my husband and my parents and Yurek lived alone in Manhattan and I described that also in the, uh, for, for Joanne. Uh, you, we, we saw each other, uh, not frequently, but at special occasions, weddings, bar mitzvahs, you know, the, gr the group organized these uh, reunions and he was always there. So I saw him, I talked to him, but I, I, I never had a personal relationship with him until, uh, until one time it just happened that I was uh, left empty handed after everybody left me. And I said, okay, this is a good time to help Yurek. And I went into his apartment and uh, basically renovated it with my own hands. <laughs> <laughs> because, and uh, I'm an architect by trade, so it, um, uh, it was something that uh, was very gratifying for me to turn this, well, since this is a public thing, I can talk about, but, uh, but you know, he was a, he was a single in, man who was an invalid. Uh, who had to take care of himself and paint at the same time. Of course, he wasn't cleaning, right? How do you clean with one arm and, you know, one, not, not, when you are not fully capable? So, um, so there was a lot of work to do and I did it uh, with fervor, I have to say. It was incredibly therapeutic for me. And during that time, we talked a lot because of course I was there every day for three months almost. And we talked and uh, he was telling me the story of his life and he was telling me about his views and uh, we had a lot of arguments. Uh, he um, was blaming my parents for not raising me well because I didn't know a lot about being Jewish um, as, was the case for a lot of us raised in communist Poland um, by our communist parents. <laughs> but, but this is when, when, we, uh, when I really found out who he was because uh, up until then I just saw him uh, you know, socially, but it, it wasn't as intimate as it became during that time. And intimate, I don't mean in any other way than mentally. And, uh, but, and so from that time on, we were in very frequent telephone contact. We exchanged thoughts, ideas. We told each other what we're doing. I would be the one who would bring him to parties. I would pick him up at his, uh, how, at his apartment and bring him to parties in New Jersey. And uh, I live in Montclair. So, and then he, you know, so this, this was, um, uh, it, it became, it became a, a close friendship. And when he found himself in the hospital, I was the only one who was, um, uh, who was free to go there. You know, I didn't have anybody at home. I didn't have family, grandchildren to watch. 
I was free to do that. And I, and it was also um, commensurate with the relationship that we had developed up until then. So I was with him during that time quite a lot in the hospital, you know, advocating for him with the nurses, with the doctors, with the bringing him things after the amputation, taking him out for walks in his um, wheelchair. He was on Amsterdam, Amsterdam Avenue and uh, 112th Street across from St. John's Cathedral. He went for walks there. Uh, <clears throat> throughout this whole thing, he was never bitter. He was Jurek bitter, but he was never, you know, he was amazingly, amazingly uh, cheerful. No, well, maybe cheerful is not a good word, but um, very hopeful for, and for a miracle. He actually believed in miracles at that time. I guess you have to when you're in that position. So he thought he would walk again with the prosthesis and everybody, everyone kept him in that belief. Sure you can, you know, yes. You, he, he believed that as soon as he leaves the hospital, he will be uh, working again, he'll be painting again. He was used to painting every single day of his life after he became a painter. So um, uh, it, 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 he was really amazing. I have to say he was, uh, he was a hero to us. He was a hero to our group. And I wasn't the only one who visited him there. There were other people, throngs of people who would come and go to see him in this uh, hospital. I, I was probably the one who uh, was um, a go-to person, you know, like I was, I was the, uh, I was the one who everybody knew that they could find out things about him because I was there most often. And, uh, and then he left the hospital. Oh, and then I, I don't know if you want to know the story about two young Germans who, I, I, I have an Airbnb in Montclair. I run yeah. an Airbnb. And Anna, can I stop you for yeah. one second? Yeah. Okay, so before you continue, which first of all, this is so fascinating. Oh, um, okay. I just want to, I want to screen share the work so we can, so we can have a visual. And I also want an opportunity to, for people to ask questions because I want to make sure that people have of time course. to do that. Okay. How much time do we have? We have about 15 minutes. Oh, that's all? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I thought it was going to go till 9.30. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure I mean it's such an interesting story. I'm sure it could. Oh, but um no. so I'm going to screen share. Okay. And um okay, so let oh, me that's wonderful. Okay, so I'm gonna just show some of the work. And while I do that, um while I do that, if Jennifer, if you want to see if anyone has questions and I don't know how to do that because I'm only looking at the work. So why don't, do people want to um, raise their hand in the reactions box? If you raise your hand, or maybe people need to just jump in. We could jump in. We're a small we, enough. I think we need to jump in because there's so few of us. So one of the people who uh, used to paint with him, and when I talked to him about his Eurex work recently, he said it's uh, what in, it's interesting that he focused on the uh, p the survivors, right? Never the perpetrators. Mm -hmm. In all of his paintings of suffering, there are no per perpetrators. They are only people who were wrong, right? And who the sufferers. And he strongly, uh, of course. Uh, um, identified with those. And you see the hands, that's his wilted hand. That's the way his hand was, the, the, his uh, right hand. Do you see? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, 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 he, he 
painted that uh, hand into almost all of his paintings. Mm -hmm. And another thing is that he insisted that his paintings are on Holocaust on entirely. There are other painters who were trying to suggest that maybe it's not just Holocaust, maybe it's just suffer universal suffering. You know, why does it have to be only about Holocaust? And he says, because it is for me, because there's nothing else in me but that, the pain about what happened during the Holocaust to all these millions of people and his family. And uh, so it, it, I don't know if it's uh, interesting from the artistic point of view, because uh, other painters wanted this to symbolize something wider than just, not that Holocaust is not worthy of being the sole theme of, of, uh, of a body of uh, work, but um, he insisted uh, that it's that every single piece is strictly about about um, Holocaust suffering. Question. Did he support himself fully? He was in, he, right. you no, know, he, well, he sold some paintings, not a lot, uh, because he didn't have an agent. Be he was on disability mm -hmm. um, and he was on, um, he was getting uh, reparations from the German, from the Germans. And he uh, also was helped by a, um, organization in New York City um, who helps uh, the survivors, but I can't remember the name of it, but I can get it for you if you're interested. It, it's a, um, I guess it's, it's um, or maybe he was getting his Medicaid through this organization. I have a question as well. Yes. Um, why after the war and the horrific anti-Semitism among the Poles that his parents returned to Warsaw rather than emigrate to the United States or to Israel or Argentina, all the other places where European survivors were, were going to. You know what, I have a little bit of an echo and I didn't, I don't know what the question was. I heard that it's about Polish anti-Semitism. You're saying why, why did um why did the parents after the war return to warsaw when they could have left europe entirely and gone because to well because uh, that's what they said a lot of these jewish people who returned and stayed were already communists and seeing the nobody you know nobody thought that this would happen nobody predict and uh, nobody foresaw it coming uh, Poland, uh, communist, uh, uh, communist Poland, Poland under under communist regime was uh, uh, was actually safe from Polish for for Jewish people was actually safe for a while. I mean until 1968, mm -hmm. but before then they were. I mean they were they were. All, there were pogroms, there were um, attacks, there were, but they, they were isolated incidents. The government protected Jewish people. There were, there were Jewish people in the government. Mm -hmm. That's why they came. They came back to Poland and stayed because they wanted to build a better system. Mm -hmm. They thought that with their help, it will be just great and everybody will have what they need and there will be no more anti-Semitism because there will be no religion. Pol now, in the meantime, Poland is 99.9% Catholic, right? So this is where they were trying to build a communist uh, uh, free of religion country. This was, it was unrealistic. And they found out the hard way not, and then, they didn't wait till 68 to find out that, that this was not a good idea. They found out even long time before then, maybe 
56, 57, 58, well, uh, especially after Stalin died, after Stalin's death in 50, 1953, but, uh, but it was too late. Once you are, we were, uh, we were behind an iron curtain, you know, we were under um, uh, Moscow's rule. So uh, once you become a member of the party, you cannot step out. That's the end of you, you know. So these people were kind of kept hostage. Some people were um, were justifying it by saying that we the party needs us because we are good people. So we will we will save the party from all those people who are who are not true communists. They are they are bandits um, posturing as communists, you know. So there were all these different views, you know, all these different approaches to, 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 to why, to, um, to why they made the choice. Yeah, a lot of a lot of Jewish people did leave after the war. They didn't have anything to do with Poland or or communism or anything. But uh, those who stayed, and there weren't many who stayed. Um, you know that in 1968, there were only 30,000 uh, Jewish people in Poland, an entire country of 30 million. We were 30,000. And we were such a threat to the Polish government that they had to exile us. They, we were such a threat that, we, you know, we, the Jewish people, they are not real Poles. They are, you know, uh, we don't want you here because you contaminate our Polish nature and, uh, and, and it's, uh, the economy is falling because of you, because of us, 30,000 people of who uh, 25,000 were kids <laughs> because, you know, or 20,000, you know, kids in schools, kids in universities. So, um, but that's, that's the way it happened. And uh, to this day, it's, yeah. It's, yeah. Um, so um, there's so, we're, we're gonna have to wrap up really soon um, because we go an hour. Um, and the, the stories you're telling, the inner rap stories are so fascinating and so rich. Um, we probably could just sit here all night and listen to you. Um, I'm, um, I'm wondering about, um, I don't really know. I've got so many questions. I don't know which one to ask. The one that's popping up in my brain though, is his daughter, his, his, uh, um, the artist's daughter. Yes. Um, you said she, she owns the paintings. You're, he you're, owns the paintings. Right, yeah. you're, you're, their, you're, you're their guardian, their guardian name. Yes, because he asked, because he, okay, this is a very delicate matter and I really cannot talk about it. Okay. it but uh, he asked me to promise him that he wouldn't be forgotten, just like I said. Right. We, were watching a, we were watching a documentary of a, a New York artist who somehow they found his body and, and, and lots of paintings and nobody knew that he was an artist and that he painted and they were fantastic paintings. So he's, he looked at me and he said, please promise me that I'm not gonna be one of those discarded forgotten artists. And I said, of course, mm -hmm. you will not be. So, and since, and then he died um, in the beginning of COVID. And we never talked about it uh, again because who knew that he was going to be, I mean, he was declining, but so we all, we hoped that he, he survived so much that we thought that he would survive that too, you know, mm -hmm. his being amputated and the, we, anyway, um, when he, uh, since the COVID started, I, um, or, or after he died, yes, and, and uh, during the COVID, I, uh, I started, I, I tried to call people. I couldn't go anywhere, right? I couldn't, and besides, I didn't have energy to do that. So I, I started calling, and you were the first uh, synagogue in Montclair that I called. I called others. But nobody else responded. You were the only. We're better. Hmm. It's because we're better. 
you were better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, was I was, good. I couldn't believe my eyes when I got this email. I can't remember from who, but I got it. Was it from you? And then I got the email that we will be happy to show the paintings. And I was like, I, I told everybody in the group, hey, you know, it's going to happen. You know, the exhibit is, I mean, the paintings are going to be taken out of the, the wraps, you know, the corrugated cardboard brown, you know, in, in, in total as storage. I took them all home. I opened them up, them up 60 paintings, over 60 paintings. I had to pick the ones that I thought were appropriate, not only what I liked uh, really, but uh, even size, some of them are very, very large and they wouldn't fit. So um, this, this was, this is a breakthrough. This is a breakthrough moment for Jurek. And uh, I hope it goes further, further. I don't know where it's okay. I mean, just listening to you and knowing a little bit of your story, what is, what's coming through, not, not only was this, you know, astonishing story of survival over, not just survival, right. but coming back to life and then a couple yeah. of rebirth and rebirth and rebirth. Oh my God. The baby almost dies and doesn't. The mother almost dies and doesn't. The father almost dies and yeah. doesn't. Every, you know, then he, then the young painter before he's a painter almost dies and doesn't. He comes back, rebirth as a painter, um, then rebirth as a father, even without a wife by his side. Um, and, and also the enormous um, influence, influence is the wrong word, um, bigger than influence, the enormous importance, centrality, um, the life-giving force of his mother. And what is coming through to me is that, that then he lost his mother, apparently, right? Because usually, God willing, the mother dies before the son. Yeah, yeah, she died. Yeah, yeah. He was. He died. He was seventy-eight when he died. She died. Um, I never met her. She. I. I really don't know. Maybe uh, thirty years ago. Maybe twenty-five. Right. The, uh, I think the daughter was already a, a, a teenager. Maybe yeah. sixteen. Yeah. So the mother dies first in her old mm. age, and then you came into his life. And it seems to me that. You know, you have played the, the role of this sustaining, loving, giving, supportive woman. And this seems to me that this is like you've sort of taken over where his mother left off. Well, it, bringing yeah. this work into the because you cannot you can't bring him back to the world. He's yeah, he's, but I have to say because uh, my, I, I have to mention that there were a lot of people who helped him. There were people who helped him. Um, um, financially, you know, there were people who may who helped him by inviting him to Florida for vacations, you know, and paying all the expenses. And there were, he had he had uh, friends in Denmark, he had friends in Poland, he had friends. Uh, you know, when I met him, I was uh, perplexed by his popularity because I did. I was like. How does this happen? So I, I even when I talked to his friends when he was in the hospital, I had to make all the calls for him and then put the phone to his ear, you know. And and the, so there were uh, women in in Paris, women in Poland, a guy in Denmark, you know, in Israel. People would come from Israel to see him in the hospital, you know, his old friends. And uh, well, that, and these are the people I heard stories about him, you know, and how wonderful he was, and how. Yeah, I'm. I'm afraid I'm. I, yeah. I we kind of have to wrap up more or less now. Yeah, yeah. I'll go ahead. But they, you know, made this event, uh, this show we're having at our synagogue at Shomri, be just the very, very beginning um, of your getting his, you know, getting his work and his story into the world. Um, because you, you might feel that you got this lucky break with us, but we feel like much more so we got this lucky break with you that you came to us. Oh, wow. We able to, all we did was say, why not? You know, you, you did mm -hmm. all the work, we opened the door. Um, so thank you for, for entrusting us with this amazing story and this amazing work and, and your, your very important dear friendship with your, your, your late friend, maybe, you know. Uh, may his memory be a blessing. Um, yeah. so I, but I think we got to wrap up now. Yep. Uh, 
So Jennifer, I was just going to say thank you to everyone. Thank you, Jennifer and Rachel, for putting this together. And Anna, thank you for sharing your stories. Oh, like you're very welcome, and I thank you. Jennifer says you're like a life force, holding his words and bringing him back. So beautifully done. Oh, thank um, you. And don't forget, the next at Nourish is Tuesday, November 16th. And that will be Mark Oppenheimer, who, if any of you listen to the podcast Unorthodox, that's Mark. Oh, yes. And he's oh. hilarious. And he wrote, he's on his book tour because he just finished his book. I forgot the name on the um, shootings at the synagogue in Pittsburgh. So Mark from Unorthodox will be coming to talk about his book. Um, so that's November 16th. So. We'll see you then. Thank you very, very Thank much. you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Jennifer. Thanks all of you for coming. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.